All right, folks, 27.5 is the acid base. Well, it's actually one of two acid base parts to this chapter. This introduces you to the pH concept, and that probably is the hardest part. And, and, and it might not be, but for some reason, uh, the pH scale gets counterintuitive. I mean, it is actually counterintuitive, but it gets tricky on test questions or whatever. Usually it's just because uh, people forget that when pH goes down, hydrogen ion concentration goes up and vice versa. So this first part is the pH scale, what pH means, what an acid means, what a base means. And then the second part, we will talk about acidosis and alkalosis. All right, so first of all, the reason that, well, pH means the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. That's what it means. In negative log, negative log really equals one over the log. That's what it, that's what it equals. So when you have one over something, as this number gets bigger, it's the denominator getting bigger, so the pH gets smaller. So as the hydrogen ion concentration gets bigger, the pH gets smaller because it's really one over the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So you see the denominator is getting bigger. So for example, one half, the hydrogen ion concentration equals two. One third, the hydrogen ion concentration equals three. One tenth, the hydrogen concentration the hydrogen ion concentration equals 10. So the hydrogen ion concentration is going from 2 to 3 to 10. It's going up, but my number is going down. I went from 0.5 to 0 0.33 to 0 0.1. So you can see why the pH scale is opposite. It's because pH means the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. That's what it means. So if you don't want to think about all of that, here's what you got to know. On the pH scale, when pH goes down, you become acidic, more and more acidic, and hydrogen ion concentration goes up. When pH scale goes up, your hydrogen ion concentration goes down. Now, neutral. By the way, the pH scale runs from 0 to 14. Neutral is 7. That's when you have equal numbers of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. So your hydrogen ions equal your hydroxide ions. They equal each other. That's at 7. Anything less than 7, you have more hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Anything greater than 7, you have more hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions. A hydrogen ion is an acid. A hydroxide ion is a base. All right, acidic is anything less than 7, basic is anything greater than 7. Um, an acid, and it depends what kind of acid, but an acid is anything that disassociates. A could be anything. An acid is anything that disassociates into a hydrogen ion plus its other thing, A, whatever A is. A base is anything that disassociates. and releases a hydroxide ion. R is anything whatever R is. All right. A salt is usually, uh, well, it's usually a cation and an anion, but the cation can't be a hydrogen ion because that's an acid. And salts disassociate. That's why in this, with the, with the term salt, the cation can't be the hydrogen ion because that makes it an acid. So why do I mention a salt here? Because when you add an acid and base together, you get salt and water. For example, HA plus ROH yield AR, that's the salt, plus HOH, that's the water. AR is the salt, whatever AR is. So you want, to, want another example? Not to do too much chemistry here, but I'll give you another example. Hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Everyone knows that one. So hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide yield sodium chloride salt plus water. 
All right. That's it. And a buffer is anything that resists pH change. Your body has plenty of buffers. Anything that resists pH change. And our body, our body buffers, keep your pH between 7.35 and 7.45. Please memorize that. There's a whole bunch of these lab values I didn't have you memorize. I want you to memorize our normal pH. All right, so a real strong acid almost completely disassociates when you put it in solution. So this real strong hydrochloric acid is a real strong acid. It almost completely disassociates into H pluses and Cl minuses. All right. A weaker acid doesn't completely disassociate. Some of them still float around as the acid rather than the proton and the conjugate base. All right, so that's a weak acid. The difference between strong acid and weak acid is how much it disassociates. Now, these are classes of acids in our body. We have um, fixed acids. These acids don't leave solution. They, re they remain in the body fluids. Uh, they, they can be eliminated by the urine, by the kidneys, by urine. But uh, they can't be eliminated other ways. Like they can't be eliminated by breathing. They can't be eliminated by, um, oh, they can't be converted to other things. Some of these acids we can convert to other things. Um, the fixed acids in our body, the most important ones anyway, are sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid. These are fixed acids. All right, so that, that's the fixed acids in our body. We buffer them, so don't worry. We'll talk about buffering them. Um, organic acids are byproducts of metabolism. They are the things like the keto acids that we talk about. The three ketones, to remind you, are acetoacetic acid. Beta hydroxybutyric acid and acetone. Those are the three ketones. You can see that these two are acids. They are organic acids. All right. Oh, how come organic acids aren't fixed? They are metabolized rapidly, so do not, whoops, can't underline. Just read this part right here. They are metabolized rapidly, so significant accumulation does not occur. So they are metabolized. They don't have to wait for the kidneys to get rid of them. All right, so these are some keto acids. Lactic acid is a, is a organic acid. So the keto acids are organic acids. Lactic acid is an organic acid. All right. Now my volatile acids. These are the things. Carbonic acid is the volatile acid. Why is it a volatile acid? Because it can be converted to CO2 and be exhaled through the lungs. So it's volatile. It's gonna. You can. You can uh, turn it. It can turn into a gas and you can get rid of it. All right. So this is a volatile acid. All right, those are the three classes of acids. Fixed acids like sulfuric and phosphoric, organic acid like your keto acids and your lactic acid, and your volatile acid like your carbonic acid, which can become CO2. Probably the best way to think of CO2 as, is as an acid. Um, if you think of CO2 as an acid, then you, you, you can, you can um, answer a lot of the questions and understand a lot of the concepts. All right, now we measure CO2 in a different way than millimoles per liter, or milligrams per deciliter, or anything like that. We actually measure it as a partial pressure. So at atmospheric pressure, you have 760 millimeters of mercury. That's how much pressure is pushing down on your head right now. But that atmospheric pressure is composed of all the gases in the atmosphere. Like you have 20.9% oxygen. You have 78% nitrogen. You have 0.03% CO2. Whoops. <laughs> you know, I do that all the time. Start a table and reverse the columns. CO2, very small percent, less than 1%. And some other things, you know, there's some helium in the air. So 
what, what does this mean? Well, it means that oxygen exerts a pressure all by itself, and nitrogen exerts a pressure all by itself, and CO2 exerts a pressure all by itself. And if you add all these pressures up by these individual gases in the atmosphere, it's going to equal 760 millimeters of mercury. Well, the oxygen pressure that it exerts all by itself is called the partial pressure of oxygen, the PO2. The, the pressure that nitrogen exerts is called the partial pressure of nitrogen. The pressure that CO2 exerts is called the uh, partial pressure of CO2. These are partial pressures. And it's another way of measuring concentration. I mean, I know it's a pressure, but the more CO2, the more partial pressure it exerts. The more oxygen, the more partial pressure it exerts. The less oxygen, the less partial pressure. So these partial pressures are, way to measure, are ways to measure uh, quantity. And if you look at this, I, I have PCO2 right here. And the PCO2 at homeostasis is 40 to 45 millimeters of mercury. But what happens if that PCO2 goes up? In other words, I just added CO2. Okay. This brings us to Le Chatelier's principle. And I think I've taught this to you before. I'm almost positive. Le Chatelier's principle. The law of mass action. Law of mass action. And that's what this says. This says that in any reversible reaction, I wish they would have drawn this reaction reversible. This reaction is reversible. In any reversible reaction, I can drive this reaction to the right or to the left by adding substrates or products. So if I add CO2, I drive this reaction to the left, to the right, to the right. I don't know my left from my right. However, if I keep CO2 the same, and I add a product, I add bicarb, then I drive the reaction to the left. However, if I subtract CO2, like breathing it out, I draw the reaction to the left. And likewise, if I subtract the protons, like I urinate them out, then I draw the reaction to the right. So the equilibrium of this reaction can be changed. Well, the equilibrium constant is the equilibrium constant. But the, um, which is the reason why this all works. I'm trying to think of how to say this. The direction of this reaction can be affected by changing the concentrations of these reactants and products. All right. So having said that, if my PCO2 goes up, I drive this reaction to the right. And if I drive this reaction to the right, I make more carbonic acid and my pH goes down. All right. Why? Because carbonic acid, being a weak acid, is going to disassociate somewhat and add protons to the solution. That's acidic. I just lowered my pH by making it more acidic. More acidic. And just a second ago, I told you if you think of CO2 as an acid, it'll be easy for you. Well, I just added the acid. I just added the acid. My pH should go down. I added the acid. Likewise... If I remove the acid, my PCO2 goes down. So now my, my CO2 is going down. All right. I'm making this reaction go to the right. All right. So now what happens is I remove the proton from the solution. Because if the reaction goes to the right, then the proton binds the bicarb. The bicarb is converted to carbonic acid, and carbonic acid dissociates the water and CO2. Why? Because my CO2 went down. My pH goes up because I remove the acid. Okay. This is the collage. How do I change my PCO2 like that? Breathing. If I hyperventilate, my CO2 goes down in my bloodstream. If I hyperventilate, my CO2 goes down. I can raise my pH by hyperventilating. If I hypoventilate, my CO2 goes up. I'm not breathing as well. My CO2 goes up in my bloodstream. My pH goes down. Sometimes I have medical conditions why I can't breathe, like emphysema. 
I mean, it's not like I want to hypoventilate. I can't help it. I have emphysema. Leads to acidosis. Low pH in my blood. So you can see that the, P, the CO2 is directly tied to my acidity. And it's kind of like this teeter-totter they're showing you. If my PCO2 goes up, I become more acidic. My pH goes down. If my PCO2 goes down, I become more basic and my pH goes up. Oh, very important concept here. So normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. And that's slightly alkaline because neutral is 7. So our normal pH is slightly alkaline. However, because normal is 7.35 to 7.45, anything less than 7.35 is called acidosis. You're going to say to me, 7.2 is acidosis? I'm going to say yes. And you're going to say, yeah, but Kiggins, uh, it's actually above neutral. You would be correct. But it's less than normal, so it's acidosis. And by the way, anything greater, greater than 7.45 is alkalosis. All right. These are three major buffer systems in our body. Buffers resist pH changes. They uh, counter pH changes. I'll show you why in a second. But the three major buffer systems are this. The phosphate buffer system, completely intracellular or actually almost completely intracellular. You do have small amounts of phosphate in your plasma. Uh, very little, like 2.8 milligrams per deciliter, something like that, so very little. So uh, the phosphate buffer system is intracellular. You got lots of phosphate in your cell. It's the major intracellular anion, if you recall. Your carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, this is the HCO3 minus is called bicarb, bicarbonate. I abbreviate it bicarb. So you have the carbonic acid bicarb buffer system. That's extracellular fluid buffer system. That's in your plasma. You, you it can, by the way, it can occur in cells too. But it, it's it's the main one extracellularly. And then you have protein buffer systems that are in both intracellular and extracellular fluid. And I'm going to show you how proteins buffer in a second. I mean, you got albumin in the plasma, you got hemoglobin inside the cells, you got amino acids in both inside the cells and in the plasma. So you have these three different buffer systems. You must memorize them and memorize where they go. All right. This is the amino acid. Here's the amine group. Here's the acidic group. This is amino and this is carboxylic acid. 20 different amino acids, 20 different R groups. All right. Now, the buffering comes from this, these two groups right here. The NH2 can accept a proton and become NH3. So if I become more acidic, I can actually buffer it by adding the proton to the NH2 and I become NH3. You can still buffer. Even if you're NH3, C, C double bond O, you can still buffer. Add another proton. Add another proton, you can become COOH. Depending on the amino acid, you might still be able to buffer. Because your R group might be able to accept a proton, might be able to. There's 20 different amino acids. Some of the R groups can buffer, some can't. If it can, you can become RH+. So in other words, this amino acid could accept three protons. One, two, three. That means as your solution, wherever this amino acid exists, if your solution becomes more acidic, the amino acid can accept those protons and remove them from solution and buffer it. Likewise, if I become more basic, this amino acid can start releasing these protons. So the solution is becoming more basic. No problem. Release this proton. Release it and become NH2. Release this one. Become R. Release this one. Become COO minus. So my amino acid can both accept and release protons. And that's what all buffers must be able to do. How do you resist pH change? You can't just donate protons that will resist the alkaline pH change. You must also be able to accept protons and resist the acidic shift. 
That is what buffers must be able to do. They must be able to accept and donate protons. And amino acids can do that, so they are good buffers. By the way, the word zwitter ion means that you are positively charged at one end and negatively charged at the other end of the molecule. So you're an anion at one end and you're a cation at the other end. You are a zwitter ion. Good, uh, what's that game? Scrabble. Good Scrabble word right there. Actually, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, it would be, except for there's 10 letters. And don't you only play with 7 tiles in Scrabble? But if you play with me, I cheat. And I draw more tiles and hide them on you. So I could probably make that word. And hope you don't catch me cheating. I'm kidding about the cheating. All right. The carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. All right, the carbonic acid bicarb buffer system. Here's how this works. Of, okay, here you have carbonic acid. All right, it can disassociate. It's a weak acid, so it partially disassociates into H plus plus bicarb. All right, if you become more acidic and the H plus of your solution goes up, you will drive the reaction this way. And the carbonic acid will be formed, and that will disassociate into CO2 and water. And that's a vo this is volatile, so you breathe out the CO2. In essence, what you just did was you just removed the acid. You just removed the carbonic acid. You're left with water. Who cares? Water's neutral water. So if you become acidic, you can remove the carbonic acid by breathing out the CO2. However... If you become basic, and that means you have a low proton concentration, you shift the equilibrium to the right, and you shift that reaction to the right, CO2 combines with water, the carbonic anhydrase converts it to carbonic acid, that disassociates and gives you another proton, another acid, and that brings you back to normal pH. And this whole thing was happening because you were alkaline. Or you had alkalosis. So this is a buffer system that can add protons to a solution or remove them from the solution. All right. And this just shows you that in this bicar carbonic acid bicarb buffer system that who adds the protons? Well, fixed acids can add the protons. The sulfuric and phosphoric acid can add protons. Organic acids can add the protons, like lactic acid and keto acid. They can add the protons. And we can buffer that because if we add the protons, the proton plus the bicarb combine to make carbonic acid. That disassociates into CO2 and water, and you breathe out the CO2. You just remove the acid. By the way, you're going to say, well, what's left over here? What if I have acetoacetic acid that donated the proton? No problem. I have acetoacetate now. That's the conjugate base. So not only did the acetoacetic acid add the proton and I removed it, but now I have a conjugate base left for my organic acid that can help me buffer some more. Now, now maybe phosphoric acid adds some acids. Well, my acetoacetate can buffer that a little bit and ultimately add acids to this and, and remove it from my body. Ultimately, you have to remove these acids from your body. There's the, there's the collage showing you the, bicarb, the carbonic acid bicarb buffer system. Now, this goes back to uh, Bio 203, the respiratory chapter, just to remind you what's going on here. 70% of your CO2 floats around as bicarb, 70% of it. So you have a lot of bicarb in your body. In fact, most of your CO2 floats around as bicarb. Some of your CO2 is bound to hemoglobin. It can disassociate. It's not permanently bound to hemoglobin, but some of it's bound to hemoglobin. But 70% of your CO2 floats around as bicarb. And this is showing you, by the way, this is showing you CO2 being loaded onto the red blood cell at the tissues because, as you know, when you do the glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain, actually glycolysis and Krebs cycle, you make a bunch of CO2s. Well, we got to get rid of that because that ultimately is an acid. Well, it floats around as bicarb. We buffer the proton. 
some of it is bound to hemoglobin. All right, so we get rid of that CO2. What do we, how do we get rid of it? We breathe it out. All right, our kidneys can be used to get rid of acids, and this goes back to the previous chapter. You're gonna feel like I'm a, you're gonna, I feel like a broken record. It's gonna sound like that. All right, I have a whole bunch of acids I produce. Well, first of all, you can just have the CO2. Your kidneys can actually get rid of CO2. How? Like this. CO2 and water combine via carbonic anhydrase to, mark, to make carbonic acid. That's a weak acid and partially disassociates into the proton and the bicarb. The proton enters the filtrate of the kidneys by a counter-transport with sodium. All right. And then this, these protons can be excreted in my urine. Well, do we buffer that? Well, we may buffer that in your urine. You don't want your urine pH to fall too low. It normally runs around 5. Urine pH is around 5, maybe 6. That's urine pH, okay? Uh, there are some conditions where it will run up to 8, and that's not completely abnormal, some pregnancy conditions and some other things like that. But it, urine is normally acidic. But you don't want to drop in too low because if it does, it will precipitate out a whole bunch of... Um, minerals and other things you can make crystals you can make kidney stones so you don't want the urine ph falling too low or you will precipitate out crystals and kidney stones and that's not a good thing so we do have a buffer system in our renal filtrate we have this phosphoric acid buffer system right here the proton can add to a phosphate and make phosphoric acid we have ammonia becoming ammonium all right so we have the phosphate buffer system and the ammonia buffer system this buffers our urine because, again, we don't want to form crystals or stones. Stones are called calculi, by the way. Renal calculi. Re renal calculus, not calculus. Calculi. Calculus is singular. Calculi is plural. And it has nothing to do with derivatives or integrals. That's just what we call a stone. All right. So that's the kidneys working for you. Look how the kidney just put bicarb into my bloodstream. That's good, because if my blood is acidic, I could use that bicarb in my bloodstream to help buffer it. So you can see that right there. By the way, as a rule of thumb, if my blood is acidic, I will retain bicarb in my blood, and I will secrete protons into my urine and get rid of them. That buffers my blood. If my blood is basic, I will secrete bicarb in my urine, and I will retain protons in my blood, and I'll bring it back to normal that way. My kidneys can do both. They can retain bicarb or retain protons in the blood. In other words, they can secrete protons or secrete bicarb into the urine. So my kidneys are are is just just as important as my lungs as maintaining a pH balance. This is showing you how I get the ammonia buffer system. I deaminate an amino acid. An amino acid has the amine group. No problem. I deaminate it. Now I have ammonia here, and ammonia plus a proton gives you ammonium, and I can urinate out that ammonium. All right, so that's what I can do there. This is just showing you the bicarb system. I'm getting sick of drawing this, and you're probably getting sick of me drawing it. But this reaction, this carbonic anhydrase reaction, is super, super important that you memorize and understand. And you, you had to do it, do it for 203 anyway. So here you go. I drew it one more time for you. I'm not going to draw it again. Obviously, this is super important. This is the enzymatic reaction. Oh, you guys learned this in the uh, digestive system too. This is how your stomach makes hydrochloric acid. So obviously, we've done this 100 times and probably literally 100 times. The carbonic anhydrase reaction here is important to make the carbonic acid. This is completely reversible. That's the important thing here. So Le Chatelier's principle is in effect. This is a collage showing you all of it. All right. This is just showing you the proximal convoluted tubule. How do I know that? I don't except for I read it right there. So it's showing you how the proximal convoluted tubule is involved in acid-base balance. All right. That's what it's showing you right there. So if my blood was too acidic, I could put protons in my urine. If my blood was too basic, I could put uh, pro leave protons in my blood. If my blood was uh, 
I, I guess if my blood was too acidic, I could put bicarb in my blood, less of it in my urine and more of it in my blood. If my blood was too basic, I could put bicarb in my urine. So you can do all of this. Your kidneys help you maintain proper blood pH. Same story. It's showing you the phosphate buffer system in our urine. We do buffer our urine. We don't want the pH going too low. We have the ammonium and the phosphate buffer system in our urine. Oh, look at that. It's telling you it's an intercalated cell of the collecting duct. That's what it's telling you. Not, I'm, I'm just pointing that out. It's not a big deal. Okay. But remember how you learned the principal cells of the collecting duct and the intercalated cells of the collecting duct? Remember how you learned that? And I told you the intercalated cell of the collecting duct is involved in the acid-base balance. So this is showing you the intercalated cell of the collecting duct doing acid-base balance. It's showing you that. Uh, what is this showing you? This is back to the proximal convoluted tubule. It's showing you that ammonia, the ammonium buffer system, NH3 can accept a proton and become ammonium, and you can urinate out the ammonium. We don't let ammonia float around our body. Remember, our liver converts it to urea, but our our renal tubular cells can make ammonia, put it in our urine, and it can be buffered into ammonium, and then we urinate that out. So not only do we have urea in our urine, but we also have ammonium in our in our urine, and that's why your uh, urine smells like ammonia because there's ammonium in it. All right, folks, so the next part is going to be um, acidosis and alkalosis, arterial blood gases, and probably arguably the hardest part of this chapter.